Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm I'm a very fluid speaker, so there'll be things in here we'll kind of skip over due to time. We may spend some time on some some other things, but we're going to cover kind of brief history of of wisps. So I want you all to understand kind of what a wisp is, what it was, and why they do some things that they do. Um, usually, I give this presentation or something like it to a lot of wisp operators. But you guys are a, a definite different different kind of audience, so I want you to kind of understand the ins and outs, um, some of the challenges the wisps uh, face, uh, both when they they started back in the dark days, and some of the network topologies they use, and you know some of, some of that stuff. And I'll leave some room for some Q and A for for folks who, hey, I may have a wisp in my area. I don't really understand kind of what's going on, or you know, why are they doing this, or that sort of thing. Um, here's the obligatory about me slide. Um, everything you want to know about me is at j2sw.com. So talking about dark days. Who remembers having to put a PCMCIA card in your laptop to get wireless? Okay, good number. So imagine that card on a tower 300 feet in the air, same card with an antenna on it. That's how a, how a lot of WISPs um, kind of got, got started. And here's, here's another example of a, a board from 20 some years ago. So for you, you folks who are router jockeys and, and switch, switch gurus, imagine having to buy a case from somebody and then your motherboard from somebody else and making your own switch. That's what a lot of these wireless internet service providers, WISPs, had to do. And they, they kind of started out as the need. I'm, I'm from a pretty small area, about three hours south in Indiana. The, we have Indiana's only waterfall, or highest waterfall, that only runs when it rains. Um, and our whole county doesn't have a three-collar stoplight. They're all the flashing yellows and reds. So broadband really isn't even still there. There's a couple pockets of Comcast and some others but the majority of people are getting internet from a, a wireless provider. So when they started out, you know, there are companies like Motorola, Canopy, uh, Microtik, um, if anybody remembers the WRT54G router. There were providers out there that was what they're servicing customers with. And a lot of it was in the unlicensed bands, 2.4 gigahertz, 900 megahertz, 5 gigahertz. Um, before streaming, my, my first WISP, we sold 256K, 512K, and one meg plans. And one meg was, you know, you're, you're paying for that one meg back then. But we could also fit 40, 50 people on a T1. So with a typical WISP, lots of natting going on. Um, old school Cisco, again, used to provide internet to folks, uh, one of my competitors had a Cisco 340 access point back in 1990, uh, not 90, about 2000, 1999, 2000, somewhere around there. They had a one watt amplifier at the bottom of this 300 foot tower, uh, Heliax going up the tower with a one watt amp at the top. FCC, if they would have came along, they would have, hey, shut that off. But it was all these guys had, and, and gals, it's all they had. So they're, they're trying to take what they can to get broadband to people. So what, what's changed for some of these WISPs? As you all know, customers want more bandwidth. We're in the streaming age. Um, cord cutters, all of that, Netflix, Google, you name it. Now, with all this government money floating around, we have government oversight. Hey, if you take government money, you have all the strings attached to it. Hey, even if you don't, we're putting restrictions on, on the service provider. You gotta be compliant. You know, if you're a wireless provider putting signals out there with radios, you have to buy via FCC regulations. There's regulations that say, hey, I can only put out so much power. I can only, um, you know, operate on certain frequencies. And as, a, as we all know, the internet is essential. We, we need to use equipment now that goes along with, are we a carrier or are we just some guy in the backyard? 
So what does a WISP look like today? Um, a lot of WISP are rapidly becoming a hybrid of fiber and wireless. Um, they're, they're, they're getting government money or the WISP is doing good enough where they can afford to build fiber where it makes sense. But there's still pockets that it's, it's never gonna make sense to put fiber in there. Um, I'll use my little, little county as an example. There's a pocket about six homes that are down in a, a valley. It used to be a, a thriving town back in the day. But to get there, it's gonna do maybe seven miles of fiber through pretty rocky terrain to get to these houses. It just doesn't make sense. So they're, they're challenging that and they're, you know, where does fiber fit? Where does wireless fit? And they're having to become a carrier. Um, the internet can't go down these days. People working from home. So Joe, who started a WISP in his neighborhood and has maybe 20 or 30 customers, he has to step up his game because those 30 customers, the, the internet's probably essential to them. And you'll, you'll see this a little, little later in my slides. A lot of these areas are remote, so environmental concerns. Hey, where, where can I even get power? Am I looking at maybe a solar deployment? Um, fiber may be 20 miles away, so how do I backhaul it in? Money, money is a pr improving it for some of these folks. Uh, grant money, local money, all of this. Um, now they're getting access to license bands. Uh, if you've heard of the CBRS, that's, that's kind of the, the buzzword among a lot of the wireless folks, including the, the 5G carriers. Um, they, they want as much spectrum as they can for, for your data. You know, your cell phone data, some of them are starting to get into fixed wireless. So spectrum, spectrum's bandwidth. The more spectrum you have, the faster you can shove bits across those airwaves. You also have the, the new modern WISP also has reporting regulations. They have to report customer data. They have to report um, to the FCC every, every quarter. And they need more bandwidth. We all know that. Everybody needs more bandwidth. And so, where, where does the WISP fit with, with 5G and cellular? And I'll, I'll kind of get to that a little. There's, there's WISPs who are utilizing, because we all know 5G is kind of a, it's a marketing thing. Um, 5G is, depending on who you ask, what is 5G? Well, is it what T-Mobile says? Is it what AT&T says? Or is it what, you know, John down the street thinks it is? So this is, this is kind of a little bit of the meat of it, of why WISPs are the way they are. And this picture says a whole lot that I can't say. This is an install. If you can see, the radio is pointed back to a tower about, oh, about two miles away. The only place this customer could get internet was at that tree. So the... The installer said, okay, I can mount it to your tree if that's okay. And as you can imagine, the customer's like, I need internet. Don't care what you do. So here we are. So having, having known that, a lot of these WISPs are, they're in the rural areas. Yes, there are WISPs in downtown Chicago. There are a lot of urban WISPs, but they don't face the same challenges as, as these folks in urban areas. Another, another thing that influences how a WISP operates their network or their network topology is how they can get those upstream connections. Uh, they may have to go 30, 40 miles to get a broadband connection that can support their network. Um, that may involve a couple microwave uh, wireless hops. It may involve doing some fiber. And a lot of these folks are just now getting into the data center space. If you're out in the rural area, you may have one option for your high-speed broadband if you're a, a provider, and that may be the local ILEC or CLEC, AT&T or Frontier or somebody like that. And if you've ever dealt with one of those, they don't like to unbundle their services very well. 
hey, we're gonna give you 100 meg pipe to this location and that's it. You're gonna have to really work on them to, hey, I need this just to go back to a data center. With some of the middle mile projects coming along, uh, it, it's getting better. There's, there's transport coming to more and more of rural America where they can just get a fat pipe back to a data center. So, you know, typically WISPs, they're not well funded. They don't have access historically to any USF or government funding. If they do, it's daunting. Um, Broadband now says the average WISP is somewhere around 1,200 customers. I kind of disagree with that a little. I think it's less. Um, I think it's in the, the 500 to 700 user range. So imagine if you're a service provider and you have to fight almost for every customer because they might be behind trees. You may have to mount it to a tree like I showed earlier. You, a lot of these folks have to get creative. So that, that kind of the mount, mount wherever you can uh, philosophy is kind of ingrained in the, the WISP uh, field. So having said all that, why? What, what all that means is it greatly influences the hardware, the mounting, and all of that that these providers use. If you're in a rural area, how many, how many people know what a grain elevator is or a grain leg? About half of them. In a, yeah, 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 yep. <laughs> so grain elevator is something a, a farmer would have that is a tall structure with these big bins. Truck pulls up. With, with corn, beans, whatever, and empties it into um, a, a device that then shoots it up to the top of this structure and then down into um, this big storage bin. And so after harvest or whatever, that's how they store, or how they store their, um, their harvest. So these are kind of predominant, especially in the Midwest and, and in the farming communities and it might be the only structure around for miles. Well, if you've ever ever had to work on one of these or been around one of them, you have these big motors that start up. Um, they're 220 volt, 480 volt, whatever they are, and it's a big draw on the equipment. Imagine, imagine locating your, your nice Juniper switch or your, your nice Cisco or Arista or whatever out on one of these places where you have to worry hey, is my voltage going to drop by 100 volts when this big motor starts up? You have to plan around stuff like that. Um, you have to worry about, hey, if I mount this, um, is dust going to get in it? Are ants going to get in it? Um, are squirrels going to come chew my cables? Uh, all, all these things you don't have to think about in a, in a data center. So Microtik is a pretty dominant hardware platform in the WISP space, just because it is extended temperature rated, it's small, it doesn't take much to run a Microtik, you know, you're running 12 volts at a half amp, you're, you're not running much power. Um, a lot of the equipment out there, it's up to 48 volt DC, but we're not talking very much amperage. So it, it, the environmental concerns are a big deal. So we all want to put the, the best equipment out there, but at the end of the day, it's a return on investment. How much can I invest in the power to make it well for me? How much can I invest in the equipment? I'm putting this equipment 300 foot in the air or 200 or even 100 foot in the air, and it's the tallest thing around. It's like putting up a big sign, hey, lightning, here I am. So if lightning takes out your equipment, um, are you going to have to replace it? And so that's, that's a big concern. Um, and this, this equipment greatly affects how the WISP can deploy their gear. We all want to put carrier-grade switches and routers and things like that. But in these rural areas, it's, it's just not possible. Um, good question. How many of you here have a wireless provider as your home internet? One, two, three, 
okay, just a, just a couple. So next couple slides, I have some kind of what, what is the typical WISP in, installment. Little panel antenna about the size of, a, say, a Pizza Hut pizza box on top of a, a house here and has Cat5 running into a PoE injector. And it may, it may go two miles, it may go three or four miles to the closest tower, hit an access point, and then go out to the internet from there. Now, going out to the internet may be, there may be a, they may get lucky and have a fiber feed at the bottom. They may have to backhaul that two or three times and aggregate it. Um, it depends. So at the, at the left here, that's kind of a, a typical uh, deployment on a, on a grain elevator. Uh, it's a little bit older. A lot, of, a lot of WISPs are sectorizing, which means if you've seen a cell tower, you see all these panel antennas 360 degrees around it. They're focusing those beams so they can get more and more data down to the customer. In the center is a couple, couple Microtech router boards, if any of you have used those, you know how flexible they are. Um, they can do wire guard, they can do VPNs, heck this little $40 guy can do BGP. Can it take full route tables? No, but it can do BGP. It can take a default route and participate in BGP. OSPF, IPv6, all that, and that's a $40 device. So we see, we see a lot of wireless ISPs use those because they are cheap. They're cheap to replace. So if Lightning or um, I had a customer of mine send me a picture uh, about the time it started getting real warm down in Indiana, he, he pulled one of these out and all the ethernet uh, ports were full of ants. They all laid their eggs in there. And they got in this little tiny hole in the bottom of his box. You couldn't even put a pencil through the hole but they all got in there and it was warm. You know, they get in there, hey, it's warm at night. Let's, let's get closer to the warm. And our, our, our last picture here is a, uh, there's two wireless backhauls on each side of this. They call it a harvestor. Um, it's this green or this big blue silo where they put what's called grain silage in. They're, they're typically 100 feet tall or somewhere around there. But again, if you can kind of see behind it, you're, you're seeing for miles out and there's, there's nothing there. There's no towers uh, where this, this location is. These, these folks are lucky to have cell phone service. So now they, they have some broadband internet. Another, another couple pictures of what your, what your typical WISC kind of deals with. On the left, this is on top of a 200 foot grain silo in, Crawfordsville, Indiana, and the right is how you get there. You have to climb up 150 some feet through this dark tunnel almost. There's light every 30 feet. So you're, you're climbing in the dark for about three or four feet on this, on this ladder. So when you're, you know, when you're talking about, do I wanna lug some Cisco switches up there with me? No. So that, that kind of comes into play. Um, and then a lot of these locations, this one, this one has their, their cables just going, going up the, the center here for, for power and things to the, the stuff at the top. So now here's some, some wire geek stuff for you. Um, this is a, a data center install for, for a WISP. They're using mainly Microtik routers. Um, there's a, uh, I think that's a brocade at the bottom. Uh, they were just starting to upgrade um, this this particular WISP. They've they've gotten beyond the 10 gig level. They're bringing in multiple 10 gigs to their network, um, and they're hey we our little microtics aren't aren't footing the bill. So they upgraded to some some big iron, um, but they still use the microtics for their their core routing. The the brocade came in and it's it's their BGP speaker. They're pulling in, they're at a data center in Texas. They're pulling in three full routing tables on that, on that brocade. So they were, they were getting to the point that, hey, it's, it's, it's time, to, time to grow up a little. And here was their, their next iteration of their stack. 
a um, couple Cisco 100 gig switches with some some micro ticks that that do do 100 gig um, and this this isn't really typical with your your most of your wisps the ones that are in data centers and are doing 100 gig they're just now getting to that level so they haven't had the experience of hey how do I navigate a data center how do I deal with you know 100 gig troubleshooting how do I validate 100 gig um, some of you you guys have been doing that for years um, last last kind of picture in my my slideshow of, of wisp stuff this is a this is wisp in down down in Indianapolis Indiana um, they have an x86 microtech um, Cisco switch all, all the the Cisco switch is gray market um, this was their first first data center deployment um, they, they didn't know how to how to navigate things they didn't have the budget to say hey I, I just need to go out and buy new stuff um, they they piece together a, a decent network for them um, they don't need a hundred gig they most of their transport pipes are one one gig pipes because that's all the uh, the local ILEC or CLEC can get them uh, they don't even have 10 gig that they can sell them so let's get into some some geeky tep topologies so you kind of understand the whys so as we go through some of these topologies that wisps are using on their wired network and i'm, I'm not mentioning wireless on on i'm not mentioning it on purpose uh, mainly because when we start talking wireless delivery, we start getting into vendor specific. Um, there's companies like Toronto Wireless, uh, Cambium, some of these folks, they all have their secret sauce of how they deliver high speed bits to the customer. So you remember back in the dark days, most of them were on that first slide, they were doing 802.11. Well, we've, we've graduated beyond that because now we're having to push 50 megs, 100 megs, and beyond to the customer. So all of these wireless delivery platforms, kind of, they're doing it, there's a basis, but they're all doing it a little bit different. So I, I purposely left that out, because then we start, start getting into vendor talk. Um, and it just gets boring. So friends don't let friends bridge networks. Um, but if you're an ISP with 20 or 30 customers and you may be hopping over to the neighbor's house and servicing six or seven customers from there, bridge network may make sense. Like I said earlier, they say the average WISP is 1,200. I think it's a whole, whole lot um, less than that. So, you know, it is what it is. It, it makes sense for them. Static routed, same same kind of deal. A um, lot of lot of WISP are doing OSPF. Uh, they may have a redundant backhaul, may have a redundant uh, exit point. Um, you know, it, it requires good gear to do OSPF on a wireless network reliably. MBLS, VPLS. This is kind of the upper upper tier of the WISP WISP market. Um, some are doing it, but and I don't want to put a, the WISP down as a whole, but they, they don't have the exposure to folks like Shinog. They're too busy in their own little world trying to you know, make their signals work. So then we talk about IBGP. You guys all know about that. That's maybe one or 2% of the WISPs out there. Um, so now, what's coming down the pipe? We talked about 5G a little. A lot of, a lot of WISP are kind of integrating that in um, they're, they're doing MVNO plays, uh, but some WISP are just losing out to the Verizons and the T-Mobiles. The they're, they're replacing uh, their service with higher speed internet. Um, a lot of WISPs aren't doing IPv6. They're start, starting into it. Um, they're using more spectrum. Uh, that gets into the, all these uh, wireless vendors and their secret sauce. It boils down to how much spectrum can you can you use. And one way folks are doing things, QOE. 
uh, quality of experience. Preseem and some of these other folks, I have nothing to do with them, but they're, they're one of them that, that come to mind. Um, I know I kind of ran through some things. I wanted to leave a little bit for, for question and answer. This is my 18-month-old uh, Rottweiler named Switch. So I know it's a lot of information, but I want to give you guys an overview. Where do you see the WISP profitability when you compare it with new products like Starlink? I, I think the profitability is... is <laughs> Well, with, with some of these competitors like Starlink and T-Mobile, uh, they're not used to that competition. So now with the, the, the competition and with the government reporting, they're having to tighten their belts. And frankly, many of these WISP operators, they just threw up a network out of need. Um, they never did a business plan. Um, so now they're having to go back and do the business side of it. And I think we'll see uh, a consolidation of WISPs um, coming down the pipe uh, as the reporting gets a little cumbersome on them. It'll be like the, the cable days back in the 80s. We'll see a big consolidation here within, I, I think I'll start in the next 12 months. Thank you all. I know there's a lot of information there, but thanks.